water. The earth was formless and void, and a wind from God was hovering over the waters. The image of water in the beginning makes sense. Most of us are familiar with the Genesis 1 story, right? It made sense to them because water was a very unknown, very tumultuous, very scary thing. And then we find a wind from God. The word for wind and spirit uh, is the same thing in Hebrew. Hovering over the waters. And then light bursts forth. And then there's dry land. And then it begins to swarm with life, green life, creatures, teeming, flying, crawling, beasts of the field. This was their taxonomy. The crawling ones, the, the flying ones, the swimming ones. They all flourished at God's word at the very beginning in Genesis 1. And then God created man, and he tasked him. He tasked him to rule this creation, this abundant life on the life-giving land, the dry land that God had created. God had breathed his breath of life into the creatures, into his creation, and he had breathed his breath of life into man. It was abundance. That's the image. It was, an Im it was completely abundance. It was provision. It was life, and it was blessing. God blessed it, and he said, be fruitful, multiply, and fill the land. We get to the story of Noah in chapter 6 of Genesis, and you can turn there if you have your Bibles or your smartphones. And we see God's perspective change radically on his good creation. Remember, he'd said multiple times in Genesis 1, and it was good, and it was very good. It was very good. The story opens of Noah. Or, yeah, the story of Noah opens in Genesis chapter 6, verse 5. And it says this, God looked... And he saw that the wickedness of mankind had multiplied on the dry land, that abundant dry land that God had created for everything to flourish. And every inclination of his thoughts were only evil all day long. Key word here in this introductory part of the story, what's happening is the narrator is setting the scene. And this, in this first section... Verses 5 through 8, it's going to be from God's perspective explicitly. We're going to hear God talking to himself, giving us his direct dialogue on the situation. And then in verses 9 through 12, there's going to be the narrator's perspective, which puts an emphasis on Noah. And so God looks down in the first section, verses 5 through 8, and he sees rampant wickedness. And remember, who are the wicked in the Bible? The kind of people who are greedy, selfish, destructive, oppressive, exploiting murderers. Maybe people like Cain. These are the kind of actions that wickedness refer to. It's a catch-all term, but I think it's important that we recognize what it referred to. And we've seen this wickedness evolve from Cain, or from Adam to Cain to Lamech. So early on in the story, we heard sermons on Cain murdering his brother Abel out of jealousy. And then Lamech, one of Cain's descendants, kills a boy just for hitting him. And he thinks it's a good thing. He thinks it's a good thing. And so there's this image of kind of the ripples from that first event, that first murder, just widening. You know, now it's not just a man murdering his brother out of jealousy. Now it's a man killing a boy and boasting about it. And that's what precedes. That's the image that precedes Genesis 6. And so God's response to this is understandable. It says in verse 6 that God was sorry or he regretted that he had made man on the earth. And it troubled him deeply. God had made this good creation. He had spoken this 
life into existence in Genesis 1, this abundance, this provision, this blessing. And this was how mankind was ruling it, not with justice, not with love, not with mercy, not with prudence, but in complete wickedness. Complete wickedness. And so God is grieved like a parent would be over what he sees. And so his response is given in verse 7. And God said, I will erase mankind, which I have made, from upon the face of the earth, from man to beast to crawling creature to flying bird of the sky, because I regret that I've made them. Because I regret that I've made them. The response to this wickedness is that ultimately God's going to wipe everything out. And God's inner monologue here, it's very rare that you hear something like this in Scripture, but God's inner monologue here uh, is full of creation words from Genesis 1. It's entirely intentional. The author wants us to recall Genesis 1 with the words in Genesis 7. Um, again, when he mentions the uh, beasts of the field, it's Genesis 124. God made them just five chapters earlier. Remember, you have to... It's really helpful to pretend that you're reading this for the first time because for most of us, this is a very familiar story of Noah, right? Noah and the flood. But here, we just saw that God created each and every one of these, the beast of the field, the crawling creatures, the birds of the air. And now he says, because of the wickedness of mankind, I'm going to wipe out the beasts of the field, the birds of the air, uh, the crawling creatures on the, on the dry land. This was their... It was a biblical taxonomy before science existed, right? They didn't, they didn't classify creatures according to biology necessarily. They were like, oh, that's the flying thing. That's the crawling thing. That's the beast of the field or whatever. And um, God said, all these good things that I've made, I'm going to destroy. You'll see these terms again and again throughout the story. And every time, the author is intentionally taking us back to creation so that we understand it through that lens. And so basically, the way the story opens, the bomb drops early, right? The bomb drops early. God says, this good creation that I made, this incredible, life-giving, abundant place that I've created, I will erase because of man's insatiable, perpetual wickedness. And when we are sitting here at just the threshold of Scripture and the threshold of Revelation and seeing and rejoicing in God's good creation, Again, the bomb drops. God says, I'm going to wipe it out. I'm going to wipe it out. But there's a glaring exception to this pronouncement of doom. And it comes in verse 8. Noah, however, found favor in God's eyes. We've heard of Noah. In chapter 5, Sam talked about it last week. That he had high expectations at his birth. Lamech, the grandson of Enoch, named his son Noah, it says in verse 529. And he said this, He will comfort us in the labor and painful toil of our hands caused by the ground the Lord has cursed. High expectations. Noah in Hebrew means rest, so that's why he called him Noah. He will comfort us in the labor and toil of our hands. Rest. They want rest. He has big shoes to fill. Noah, and now we see him front and center in a chaotic world, finding God's favor when the rest of the world is finding the exact opposite. Every inclination of mankind was wicked. Violence was rampant, and yet Noah found favor in the eyes of God. 6, 9 through 12 gives us the narrator's perspective, not God's inner monologue anymore, but the narrator's perspective, and the emphasis is on Noah. Verses 9 and 10, these are the generations of Noah. Noah was a righteous man and blameless in his generation. He walked with God. And Noah had three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. So the picture of Noah, or sorry, picture Noah, the righteous man, who, surrounded by the prevailing wickedness in mankind, was fair. He didn't wrong people unjustly. He spoke the truth, etc. Didn't 
take life carelessly. He, in summary, he walked with God, a phrase used only one other time in Scripture, his great-grandfather, Enoch, right? Noah was the opposite of the culture and moral consensus that surrounded him. He embraced justice instead of injustice and favoritism, truth instead of deceit, loyalty instead of betrayal, and life instead of murder. Those are the traits that mark the righteous man throughout Scripture. This is what being righteous is like. Noah was righteous and blameless in his generation, in God's eyes. By contrast, the rest of the land is described as spoiled in the next verse. And it's a key term throughout the story. Again and again, we're going to see this. But the, but the earth was spoiled or ruined before God's eyes, and it was filled with lawless violence. Again, it's saying the same thing in the first introduction, but in a different way. And God saw the land, and look, it was spoiled, it was rotten, because all flesh had spoiled its way upon the dry land. Picture God looking down at what was a beautiful 16-hour roasted lamb shank, right? Put a lot of effort into a meal like that. And now it's just crawling with maggots. That's the image. Something that's ruined, spoiled, useless. What was very good in Genesis 1 and abundant and blessed is now a world racked with violence. Upon the hospitable dry land God created, he sees his creation ruining their path. It's the image, dry land, there's a road on it, and they're ruining it. And as the verse says, God was grieved. In both takes on the same idea, and this is what the author's introducing us to as the story starts and as we see how it's going to unfold. In both takes on the same idea, we see Noah, the righteous man, explicitly contrasted with the rest of mankind. The narrator wants us to look at Noah. First man is wicked and must be erased, but Noah finds favor with God. Second, we see the upright man, Noah, who is blameless and walks with God in a world that's rotting under violence. And it's filled to the brim with injustice. Noah is a story of many firsts in the Bible. And as God will later do with Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and many others, culminating ultimately in Jesus, our Messiah, he here, for the first time, God for the first time in all of Scripture, shares his plans with his righteous follower, Noah. He shares with Noah what he's going to do with the world. The narrators put our eyes on Noah. God's eye is on Noah, and now God is going to speak to Noah. Verse 13, God said to Noah, the end of all flesh has come before me because the earth is filled with lawless violence because of them. And look, I am going to destroy the land. There's a wordplay here in Hebrew that is significant because it encapsulates ultimately in a poignant way God's response to the current situation of mankind. The earth is nishchat, spoiled or ruined. And so God says here he will hashchit, ruin or destroy it. The pun is intentional. It's the proper response for something that is spoiled, just like you throw out that rotting hunk of meat covered in maggots, right? And it's, it's God's reaction. It's God's reaction to what he sees. In verse 14, now that Noah knows from the lips of God what's going to happen, or, or God's perspective on the earth, God tells, God gives Noah instructions. He says this, make for yourself an ark of gopher wood. And he continues with detailed instructions on the design of the large boat. That's what the ark is, a large boat. He tells them to make it full of rooms and areas and whatnot, make it massive. But interestingly, and I'm not going to read through all the instructions. They're kind of tedious. Um, but it's inter- the, the point is, it's going to be very large. And there's not going to be a rudder or a sail, which if you're trying to navigate waters, is a rather terrifying thing, right? It's a rather terrifying thing. And so 
he is going to have to completely depend on God in this ark, in this large boat. He's going to be helpless. In verse 17, we see how the earth is going to be destroyed. He says this, And me, look, I'm bringing the cataclysmic flood waters upon the earth in order to destroy all flesh which is in it, which, which has the breath of life in it under heaven. Everything which is on the earth will die. Remember how their creation story starts in Genesis 1. In the beginning, God created the earth. It was formless and void, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. There's no land, just water. No life, no prospect for life, darkness. God says here, he will bring a cataclysmic flood of water on the land. Everything on land will die. God's good creation will be undone. But God intends to save some. God intends to save some. We read on in verses 18 through 22, but I will establish my covenant with you and you will enter the ark, you and your sons and your wife and your sons' wives with you. You are to bring into the ark two of all living creatures, male and female, keep them alive with you. Two of every kind of bird, of every kind of animal, of every kind of creature that crawls on the ground will come to you to be kept alive. You're to take every kind of food that is, in, that is to be eaten and stored away as food for you and for them. So, who will be saved? God tells Noah, his righteous man, that he and those with him, his family, and a remnant of the animal life on land will be saved. And it's more firsts, more firsts in this story of unfolding creation, in this story that tells us about God's people. It's more firsts. God says he will make a covenant with Noah here, a serious binding contract. This is the first place that ever happens. God says to Noah, his righteous man, I'm attaching myself to you. You, Noah, who walk with me, who actually represents what I want from mankind, you will be saved by me, and I promise myself to you. Creation will be undone. The torrential waters will cover everything again. And it will be as it was in the beginning. The flying birds, the beasts of the field, the crawling creatures, and even mankind made in God's image to govern, made in God's image to govern the world, will be destroyed because it derelicted his divine duty to rightly rule. But another first, and this is extremely significant, the righteous man and all those with him will be saved. It is the righteous man and all those with him who will be saved. Note that God lists again and again in this passage that taxonomy that I talked about, the crawling things, the, the flying things. You know, I mean, it's translated birds, obviously, but that's, that's sort of really how they viewed it. He lists that taxonomy of all the creatures that will be saved by righteous Noah just as he did those that would be destroyed. It's creation language. And so it's pointing us in a new direction right? We remember God's creation once. We see that God's creation is going to be undone by this torrent of water coming upon the world. And then we see, again, all the creation language attached to Noah, attached to Noah, the righteous man. And so with God's announcement here in the passage, we see the seed for a new creation, a new creation in the ark through the righteous man, Noah. It's the very first time we see this concept in the Bible. It's to those of us who come to church or are familiar with the Bible, this is kind of a common thing, I guess. It's not a new concept that the righteous person would be saved, but it's the very first time we see this. And this theme will grow and grow through Abraham. Remember, God ch chose Abraham and his descendants to David and through millennia of Jewish history to culminate in a more familiar righteous man, Jesus, whose followers are called a new creation. Listen to how Paul puts it, 2 Corinthians. So then, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. What is old has passed away. What is new has come, and all these things are from God, 
who reconciled us to himself through Christ. In the Messiah, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting people's trespasses against him. And he's given us this message of reconciliation. God made the one who did not know sin to be a sin offering for us, so that in him we would become the righteousness, righteousness of God. Righteous Noah is saved. Righteous Noah is saved. Through Jesus, the Messiah, God creates an entire community of righteous Noahs, as it were, who walk with God according to his desires for humanity, justice, peace, unity, love, a new creation in Jesus, not like the rest of the world. So Noah, Noah was the first righteous man, the very first righteous man chosen for this kind of task, and as it were, Jesus Messiah would be the last. So in chapter 7, we move on. Much time passes, and the narrator says that Noah does, as God says, Noah did what God told him to do, and he builds this massive barge that will be a lifeboat for all existence during the cataclysmic flood that is coming on the land. A week before the beginning of the deluge, God tells Noah in the beginning of chapter 7 to get a few extra ritually pure animals in anticipation of the sacrifices that would take place after the ordeal. The ritual sacrifice of animals was a common practice throughout the Middle East and elsewhere in Noah's time. So Noah did that. It made sense to him. And we pick up with the story in chapter 7, verse 7. And it is the beginning of the end. And Noah and his sons and his wife and his sons' wives entered the ark to escape the waters of the flood. Pairs of clean and unclean animals, of birds and all creatures that crawl along the ground, male and female, came to Noah and entered the ark as God had commanded him. And after seven days, the floodwaters came on the earth. In the 600th year of Noah's life, on the 17th day of the second month, on that very day, all the springs of the great deep burst forth, and the floodgates of the heavens were opened. This event was so ingrained in the conscious collective, or the collective consciousness of Israel, that the exact calendar date was meticulously recorded. You don't see this very often. And it makes sense. Not only because of the sheer horror of something like this happening, of there actually being this extinction level event type flood, But because it's the very, again, the very undoing of creation. Genesis 1 began with darkness and void and God's wind hovering over the deep. The deep, or in Hebrew, it's the word tehom. And here in verse 11, it's the same word, the tehom. The great deep is no longer held back by God's powerful hand. Chaos and destruction burst forth. And the land that was so perfectly suited for abundant life is covered by the very thing that completely prohibits it. The primordial waters from the very beginning, all is lost. And God shuts the door behind Noah and the great deep bursts bursts forth from below and the torrential downpour continues from above for 40 days and 40 nights. The text paints a vivid image in verses 17 through 20 of the water rising and rising and lifting the ark up off the ground, it continues rising and rising and rising in this torrential downpour such that even the tops of the mountains are covered. I don't know if you've ever seen the movie Deep Impact. It's a bit old. Uh, But there's a comet that hits the East Coast um, just off New York City, I think. And it causes this massive flood that goes into the Appalachian Mountains, and you see people scrambling to the tops of mountains to survive because they're not covered all the way by the water. And the narrator makes clear here that that is not the case. Everything is covered. There was no escape. The tops of the mountains, not a safe haven. This was, again, as we would say in our terms today, an extinction level event. And the unimaginable conclusion of this, God's reaction to the earth being completely full of violence instead of life, death instead of blessing and abundance, the conclusion of it becomes a reality. Verses 21 and 23. Every living thing that moved on the earth died. 
Every living thing that moved on the earth, the dry land, died. Birds, beasts of the field, wild animals, all the creatures that crawl over the earth, and all mankind. Everything on dry land that had the breath of life in its nostrils died. Every living thing on the face of the earth was erased. Men and animals and the creatures that move along the ground, the birds of the air, were erased from the earth. Only Noah was left and those with him in the ark. It was done. God said in his deep sadness that he would wipe out mankind and the dry land because of their complete perversion of creation, right? And he did. Only our righteous man, Noah, and those who were with him remained. Life had begun so brilliantly and abundantly at creation just five chapters previously. If you were reading it, it would have been six minutes ago. And now... That life hangs barely by a thread as we see a small band of survivors and a paltry representation of the rest of the animals on a big barge. Noah and the terrified band of survivors now wait in thunder and rain and darkness and massive swells and no steering. All the windows were shut. It was completely dark. And all they could do now is hope in God. All they could do now is hope in God and his commitment to them through Noah to deliver them. And so they did. They wait, hope, and wonder, as the text says, for 150 days. Half a year. as the end of chapter seven states. And during that time, they don't see the water levels abate. They don't see any hope, I guess. They don't see any dry land. Chapter eight marks the turning point in the event. And it opens with the first hopeful words that we've heard in the story in a long time. And God remembered Noah and all the wild animals and the livestock that were with him in the ark. And he sent a wind over the earth. And the waters receded. In the first creation in Genesis 1, we remember God's wind hovering over the deep. Right? And then light and dry land and life bursting forth in grand display. And now here we see God remembering his righteous man Noah and those with him and again, his wind is on the water. Another time, the language is very intentional, very intentional. And with that, we see the recreation of all things beginning through the righteous man, Noah. Chapter 8, verse 2. The springs of the deep and the floodgates of the heavens were closed, and the rain stopped falling from the sky. The water receded steadily from the earth. At the end of the 150 days, the water had gone down, and on the seventh day of the seventh month, the ark came to rest on the mountains of Ararat. It's in Turkey. The waters continued to recede until the tenth month, and on the first day of the tenth month, the tops of the mountains became visible. More than half a year had passed since the waters burst forth to, the, to flood the dry land, and now for the first time since then, hope emerges. God had not forgotten his allegiance to Noah, his righteous man. And Noah sees this. Noah sees this for the first time. God hasn't spoken to Noah yet in the story. He was alone. Or at least since, since, the, since the flood happened, that is. And after the water levels begin to recede and mountaintops become visible, I imagine that Noah began to hope a little bit more that his salvation was coming. And so as the story continues on in, in verses 6 through 14, it's the part where he uses the birds, right? He uses ravens and doves to probe the area to see if and where land and vegetation are reappearing. Ravens were used by crews on ships 
for direction, they would release the bird and note the direction that it would fly. Ravens could fly for a long time. And so they, if they saw land, they would head toward it. Uh, and they would assume it was headed toward dry land, and they would go that direction. Doves, on the other hand, can't fly far. So says, first Noah sends a raven, and then he sends a dove. Doves, on the other hand, can't fly far. So they inform Noah not of the direction, but the distance to the dry land. If it didn't return, dry land was close. Dry land was close. So as the raven does not return, and eventually the doves, we see the water steadily receding, and finally, when the dove brings back this fresh olive tendril that had re-sprouted, uh, symbolizing new life, we know that dry land has come again. It's a significant event. Again, the life-giving thing in the way that they understand the universe, or the way that they understood the universe was the dry land. Without it, life couldn't exist. And that's why there's such an emphasis on it in the creation story. First it was covered by water, and then dry land appeared, and that fostered the rest of life, the birds, animals, and mankind, the dry land. And so for the first time in this recreation story, Noah encounters dry land. And there's hope for a recreation. There's hope for a new abundance after Genesis 1. And now that there is dry land, we read in verse, verses 14 through 17, by the 27th day of the second month, the earth was completely dry. It's more than a year after it began. And for the first time in an entire year, God speaks to Noah. Then God said to Noah, come out of the ark, you and your wife and your sons and their wives. Bring out every kind of living creature that is with you, the birds, the animals, and all the creatures that move along the ground so that they can multiply on the earth and be fruitful and increase in number on it. We move from uncreation to recreation, and now, now we're in the aftermath of the flood. We're waiting to see what God will do. And what God does is he echoes and reinstitutes here exactly what he says to his newly created animal life in Genesis 1. It's the same words, be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth. This is the creation mandate. This is God blessing life. The new beginning is beginning. Life is restored. Abundance is possible again. Dry land has appeared to support life, and God blesses it. And Noah gazes upon the recreation of everything good, and in verse 20, proceeds to build an altar to God. It's another first in Scripture. Noah performs a whole burnt offering with the extra ritually clean animals he had taken. Remember from the beginning of chapter 7. It was a common practice in his time. And we don't know, we don't know the purpose of Noah's sacrifice here. It's not explained, and it's not good to make assumptions. Uh, the term for a whole burnt offering can refer to a lot of different contexts, I guess. Um, it was typically associated with petitions or requests. So Noah sees this happening, and he makes an offering, maybe to make a request to God. We do know, though, from the story, how God responds positively. We read in verses 21 and 22, chapter 8. The Lord smelled the pleasing aroma and said in his heart, Never again will I curse the ground because of mankind, even though, even though every inclination of his heart is evil from childhood. And never again will I destroy all living creatures as I have done. As long as the earth endures, seed time, and harvest, cold and heat, summer and winter, day and night, will never cease. Remember way back in chapter 5 when Lamech said that Noah would comfort us in our labor and painful toil of our hands caused by the ground that the Lord had cursed? That's what he wanted. He named him Rest because he wanted rest from the curse of land, right, after, the, after Adam's sin. Lamech, it turns out, was right. Because of Noah... Because of righteous Noah, God says here, I will never curse the ground again because of man. It's a direct echo of that passage. And that despite the inclination, and that, sorry, and that despite the inclination of his heart being evil, righteous Noah and his life and sacrifice here please God such that he swears he will never respond again to man's wickedness as he did at the beginning of the story by wiping them out. Which is incredible to think about. God is so pleased 
by Noah that he will not again repay the violence and the wickedness of man with the destruction of creation as he did in this story. And I think that concept turns us toward God being utterly pleased as we gather thousands and thousands of years after the story of Noah. There's been a lot of history, but it turns us toward the concept of God being utterly pleased at his son, Jesus, the Messiah, and us finding our righteousness through faith in him. The Apostle Paul says this, I consider everything a loss compared to the surpassing greatness of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them rubbish that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God and is by faith. It is Christ's work for us, his righteous life, his atoning death, and his life-giving resurrection that gives us righteousness and empowers us to live that life of righteousness, that life of justice and peace and love and unity. Like Noah, God looks at righteous Noah and says, because of you, I'm not going to do this again. I'm not going to destroy the world again. Trusting Christ to empower us to live as God wants, being in his family, kind of like Noah's family was on the ark. Noah's actions in life here are, again, a seed of sorts, like many things in the book of Genesis, for concepts that develop throughout Scripture. It's the very beginning of the story, and you can't front load it with everything, right? But we see it in a seminal form here. A lot of this stuff in the story of Noah, it's a story of firsts, that God could look toward the righteousness of one man and be so pleased that he suspends his rightful judgment of the wicked. It began with Noah. So God further responds to Noah, chapter 9, by reissuing his supported blessing on mankind. Just like he did with the beasts a few verses ago. Verses 1 through 3, he says, Then God blessed Noah and his son, saying to them, Be fruitful, increase in number, and fill the earth. Again, creation language. It is riddled with it. That's exactly what God said in Genesis 1. The fear and dread of you will, be, will fall upon the beasts of the earth and all the birds of the air, upon every creature that moves on the ground, upon all the fish of the sea. They are given into your hand. Everything that lives and moves will be food for you. Just as I gave you the green plants, I give you, every, I give you everything. However, do not eat meat that still has its lifeblood in it. It's identical to how God blessed the first couple, Adam and Eve, in Genesis 1. Creation is reborn, and mankind's place as God's appointed caretaker and ruler and steward of creation is reinstated. Man being made in the image of God is reaffirmed. Righteous Noah is the beginning of a new creation, of a new mankind. But God makes two important changes here that are noteworthy, I think, after the flood. He permits the eating of animals for the first time on the condition that their blood is not consumed. And it's because blood was seen as the very life force of an animal or a person back then, provided by God and God himself. I mean, the image is if you run out of blood, you die, right? They observed that. And so instead of consuming it, returning it to the earth was a symbol acknowledging that it belonged entirely to God and was not something to be exploited. That's the point of that. In verses 5 through 7, it gives a similar injunction, a new command, I guess, to mankind. And for your lifeblood, so for the lifeblood of men, I will surely exact punishment. I will exact punishment from e- for every animal and from each man too. I will demand an accounting for the life of his fellow man. Whoever sheds the blood of man, by man his blood will be shed. For in the image of God, God has made man. As for you, be fruitful and increase in number, multiply on the earth and increase upon it. God institutes capital punishment. Remember, this is a first. Cain was not killed for murdering his brother. Cain was not killed for murdering his brother, just punished. However, 
since that led to wanton violence and senseless murder, God now demands that mankind recognize how utterly sacred his existence is, created in God's image to rule as he would justly, and recognizing how sacred life is. Remember, life and abundance is the theme of the creation story. And life and abundance and prosperity are God's intention for creation. He blesses both man and animal to be fruitful, to multiply, fill the earth. And murder is the exact opposite of that. Thwarting God's provision for abundant life, stopping his blessing that people multiply. And so he says murder will no longer be tolerated. Finally, in the story, God moves to formalize the covenant that he promised to Noah before the flood began. It's another first in scripture. And it includes all of creation of mankind and beast and bird. Verse 8. Then God said to Noah and his sons with him, I now establish my covenant with you and your descendants after you and with every living creature that was with you, the birds, the livestock, all the wild animals, and all those that came out of the ark with you, every living creature on earth, I establish my covenant with you. Never again will all life be cut off by the waters of the great flood. Never again will there be a flood to destroy the earth. And God said, this will be the sign of the covenant I'm making between me and you and every living creature with you, a covenant for all generations to come. All generations, this is never going to stop. I have set my bow in the clouds, and it will be the sign of the covenant between me and the earth. Just as circumcision was a sign of God's covenant with Abraham and circumcision existed before Abraham. It was a very common practice in the region. So obviously rainbows existed before the flood, right? The point is that God attaches his covenant, his promise to a symbol and he gives it significance. He gives it significance. God's bow in the clouds almost certainly a rainbow, but the word is bow. Like, my bow in the clouds is my promise to you. I'm giving this meaning. I swear now, having attached myself to you, righteous Noah, having been pleased by you and your sacrifice, I now formally swear to all creation, never again will I do this. Noah, who walked with God, you can imagine this from his perspective, can now rest assured that, he would not just, that God would not destroy what Noah had suffered through to see happen, the recreation of the world through him, the righteous one, and God's providence. It's not a self-righteous thing, but you can imagine if Noah went through this whole ordeal and then God did it again. Noah can now rest assured that that won't happen. This new creation that God began through Noah and the story would endure. It makes sense that this story is often preached in Christian communities as an allegory for the church. The righteous saved by God while the wicked perish. And its familiarity sometimes causes it, I think, to be lost on us. Um, Admittedly, the point of the story is not to be an allegory for Christ and the church or the, the church and the final judgment or whatever. That's really bad interpretive practice. That's not what he's talking about. He's talking about Noah. But we can see for the very first time ever in the Bible this fundamental concept in Scripture of the deliverance of the righteous and the judgment of the wicked played out on a grand scale. Noah's story anticipates a long line of righteous men and women chosen by God that leads ultimately to Christ, descendant of David, descendant of Abraham, and as it were, descendant of Noah, who walked with God. Christ is our deliverance from God's wrath. Christ is our deliverance from sin. And as we saw God's mercy and favor rest on all those who were with Noah, several places throughout the text, And it's four chapters long. I'm sorry, I obviously couldn't read through the whole thing. I summarized a lot. Um, But again and again, we see that anybody who is attached to this righteous man, Noah, is saved. 
in this case, his family and the animals. And so too, just as God's mercy and favor rested on those associated with Noah, so too God's mercy and favor rests on all those who follow his son Jesus. Jesus is the chosen one, as it were. And all who align themselves with him, anybody who joins that family, it's the metaphor in the New Testament, after all. The bride of Christ in Ephesians 5, becoming one with Christ. You're the family now. Your family with Jesus, no matter your background, lineage, heritage, status. That's the image. If you choose to follow Jesus, then you are in the family. And God's favor and his love and his full acceptance fall on you. Jesus is your peace. He came as the Messiah to deliver all of us because none of us deserves God's mercy. Yet in Jesus, he gives it freely. Chaz is going to come up and play, and we're going to do communion. Um, and here at Loft, uh, the way we do communion is uh, we have the elements on the tables here, and whenever you're ready, you can just come up and get them. And then uh, after we uh, li listen to and sing the communion song, uh, we'll do it. We'll do it.